I'm at Malcolm Knapp Research Forest, and as you can tell behind me, I'm obviously in an area that has been recently harvested. Um, and before we get into what's been done recently, uh, maybe we can learn a little bit about the history of this stand. Ellen, can you talk a little bit about how this stand originated and what it looked like prior to the harvest? Yeah, so if you look around, you might see evidence of past logging, and some of that evidence is in the form of very large stumps. So the history here is that in the 1920s, there was a lot of logging in this area, and most of those trees at the time were quite old and were old growth trees. Following that logging in 1931, there was a large fire that was sparked due to the logging activities. Um, at the time, they were using steam engines, and that just swept through here. And so what we had prior to the logging was an even age stand that originated after the 1931 fire. So prior to the harvest, what was the uh, species distribution and size distribution like in the stand? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're actually in the coastal western hemlock dry maritime subzone. And the typical conifer species here were also found on this site. That was coastal Douglas fir, western red cedar, and western hemlock with a bit of deciduous red alder, black cottonwood, but very only in, primarily in riparian areas. In terms of the size distribution, um, by volume, 50% of the stand was western red cedar. There was a smaller subset of coastal Douglas fir, about 20 to 20% 20 of the stand, but by volume, they're actually quite significant. They probably vary between one and, and three meters cube per individual tree. Um, and then there was quite a bit of hemlock as well. One of the big objectives for us was to incorporate some of the, the education, so the student learning and their involvement in the planning and the data collection. Um, but another objective is that over this way is Marion Lake. And Marion Lake is an important feature at the Malcolm Knob. And from a dock across the lake, this block was viewable from there. So we were hoping to address that with a high level of retention in three different treatment units. One of them was primarily just leaving the coastal Douglas fir. Uh, they are wind from trees, they have a taproot. They were also they're shade intolerant and therefore they were the first trees to establish post fire in 1931. They would have been the first trees to really set root and get above the crowns of the coastal western hemlock and the western red cedar that came in a little bit afterwards. So that was one treatment unit, unit leaving the coastal Douglas fir and that's what you can see behind me here. We had another unit that's about two hectares in size where we left a mixture of cedar and fir. Then the third unit was two riparian buffers where we did a low thinning. And that was just a selection based on the smallest trees and a mixture of all the species distributed evenly. And those treatment units, I believe we left around 40 to 45% of the basal area. And can you define what a low thinning is? Low thinning or thinning from below, the concept there is that you're removing uh, the smallest uh, trees, the ones that are suppressed, the intermediate trees, and what you're leaving behind is the dominant and co-dominant trees primarily. So you're leaving behind kind of the, the big trees that are the dominant in the canopy, but you're removing some of their competition to give them more resources to, yeah. to grow. It's a little bit about removing the, the competition, and it's also um, about removing the trees that would be less wind firm in this case. Mm -hmm. We were concerned about wind and wind throw. Um, in particular, some of the wet areas and the riparian areas have uh, saturated soils. The root zones are maybe more, have a stronger tendency to fail in the event of a large windstorm. In a harvest with individual dispersed retention like this, why are you thinking about wind firmness? The issue is that these trees all grew together, shielding each other from the wind and supporting themselves in the storms. And when you open up a stand, those trees are now more vulnerable to wind throw because they didn't establish themselves and grow in open conditions. So they're being exposed to much stronger winds than they had been when it was a yeah, closed canopy exactly. forest. So aside from wind firmness, how did you decide which trees to mark as leaf trees? 
If you look around, you'll notice that there are spray painted L's on some of the trees. We pre-selected those trees based on the wind firmness of the trees in mm -hmm. particular. So the three treatment units had slightly different objectives. The first biggest unit was around leaving the Douglas fir because of their wind firmness. We were looking for the ones that had the largest diameter um, relative to their height. And the other treatment unit, we also captured some of the large cedar, but we also had to think about the operability and how the machines were gonna maneuver on the site to yard and, and skid all the logs back to the road. The third treatment unit in the riparian areas, that one, the low thinning, we left the selection of the trees up to the, the hand faller. So we gave them some criteria with a sense for the spacing we were looking for and said, go for it. <laughs> so aside from the aesthetic goals of not having a, a very open harvest viewable from Marion Lake, uh, what are some of the ecological uh, advantages of having a, a clear cut with retention rather than a clear cut with, with no retention? What I saw as an important objective here is that we are transitioning this forest into more uneven age structures than what we had over the last hundred years following the logging and the fire in, the 19, in 1931. So by diversifying that structure, different size classes, mixtures of different species, um, hoping to promote some of the biodiversity objectives that we, we like to foster here at the research forest. And from an operations perspective, how does having dispersed retention change uh, what they are able to do or how they're able to, to do the falling and uh, removing of the logs? Well, I spoke to the loggers after or during the operation several times, and this is challenging for them. Uh, it's challenging. The site is very bluffy. It has a lot of rock outcrops. So there was only a few access trails to be able to retrieve the logs. All the logging was ground-based, meaning the falling was done with a feller buncher. And in areas where the feller buncher couldn't get into, it was all hand fall in. Then all the yarding was either, primarily I believe ho-chuck is how they did it. So because of that, it was challenging to maneuver around all the leaf trees. So it's important like when they're falling trees and when they're, they're uh, removing the logs, they need to be very careful not to hit and injure the leaf trees because they might make those trees more susceptible to disease or something that might cause them to not survive in the long term. Yeah, so, so I, I'd say there's two factors. Mm -hmm. There is being careful not to damage the leaf trees, as you said, but the other one was that one of the types of logs we were trying to uh, retrieve from this site was poles, utility poles. They're extremely long. And so damaging those poles would then diminish the value of the logs that we get out of this block. Why try to cut some trees as utility poles, then cut them all for lumber if that would be easier to remove them if they were in shorter lengths? The, the value, the economics of it. Um, at this moment in time, uh, utility poles for cedar uh, and the value there, depending on the length of the pole, is anywhere from $500 to $700 per meter cube, compared to saw log values, uh, anywhere from $200 to $500 per meter cube. So we're trying to manage this to achieve certain objectives that have to do with biodiversity, with visual quality, um, with diversifying our stands of the landscape, but we're also trying to generate some revenue. So if I can offset the revenue losses from leaving these mature trees behind and getting more revenue from the trees that we actually are removing, I think that's a win-win. So now that the harvest is completed, what's the plan for regenerating this stand? So we're going to wait one season to let all the slash settle and the timing of our planting is typically right right now at this time of year. In early, kind of early spring, like early April, spring, May? Early spring, yeah. Usually this year we're a little late, but early, early April, uh, mid-March, that's the time of year for the spring plant. Mm -hmm. uh, we're planting a, a mixture of species. We're gonna introduce some species that we haven't seen in here very much, including Amabilis fir. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be some coastal Douglas fir and Western red cedar. 
Now, why aren't we going to plant the western hemlock, Patrick? Uh, that's a question we ask all of the students here, and it's because it is a prolific uh, regenerator, and you don't need to plant a single western hemlock, and they will come in to this stand, and you will definitely get some western hemlock. They will naturally seed themselves. So besides the mature leaf trees, I noticed that there are a fair number of smaller trees in maybe the three to five meter range. Can you tell me a little bit about why those are here and what role they're playing? Yeah, we have a few pockets of trees, areas where we ask the loggers and to leave some of the advanced regions. So those are suppressed or intermediate or smaller little seedlings and saplings, primarily in some of our smaller uh, stream riparian areas, as well as there's a rocky bluff right here. It's such a hard place to grow new trees, mm -hmm. so let's just leave that advanced region. So you're, you're taking advantage essentially of some uh, saplings that were already present That's in the right. stand, and now that the stand is open, they're going to be getting lots of light, and they're going to be released and, and able to. Yeah, grow and even well. if they don't get released, it creates this like more patches of different structure in the stand. So it'll create a little bit more of a heterogeneous yeah. uh, stand. More diversity. Uh -huh.